called Al Fath al Majid, the Sharh Kitab al Tawheed. Very famous book, easy to read book, easy to comprehend. It's one of the easier explanations. And his cousin, the cousin of that man, Abdurrahman ibn Hassan, he had a cousin who obviously was also from the grandchildren of Sheikh Islam, Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab. He also came and explained his great grandfather's book. His name was Sulaiman ibn Abdullah. Ibn Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab. And he called his book Taysir al Aziz al Hamid fi Sharh Kitab al Tawheed. Very famous book. In addition to those two, we have the book called Al Jadid fi Sharh Kitab al Tawheed. And that was by another scholar of the Sunnah, a Sheikh Muhammad ibn Abdul Aziz al Qarawi. A Sheikh Muhammad ibn Uthaymeen. He did one of the best explanations of this book, Al Qawl al Mufid, Fi Sharh Kitab al Tawheed. And Sheikh ibn Uthaymeen also did an explanation of the explanation of what we just mentioned. And many other ulama. The shahid from that kalam and the point from that kalam is that the ulama who we honor, love, and we respect, and we use them as guiding lights and guiding posts to help us arrive to what will benefit us in the deen and the dunya, in the akhirah, they paid attention to this book. The Sheikh Salih al-Fawzan, he explained the book in more than one attempt. He has more than one book where he dealt with this book. So you have those scholars who made taliqat and they made notes about the book. Scholars who came who made the book mukhtasar or they made it concise and they serviced the book from them is our Sheikh Abu al-Harith Ali al-Halabi al-Athari and other than them, may Allah Ta'ala have mercy upon those who have died and may Allah Azza wa continue to bless those who are still remaining from our ulama and our shiyukh. This book, Kitab al-Tawheed, Ikhwani, has many mumayizat. It has many points connected to it that make it a special book. It sets it far apart from other books. If you're going to read books of a Tawheed, this particular book, it has many, many. The main one that I want to mention and draw your attention to, inshallah, Azwajal, because of its importance and because it will help you, Akhi Zakaria, it will help you, Abdul Rahman, it will help an individual to grow and develop in knowledge, grow and develop in knowledge and be protected from those things that give him a headache, those things that make him confused, those things that will take up his time. And that particular characteristic that sets the book apart is that the book just deals with proofs. That's it. It just deals with delil. That's it. It is similar to what the scholars of al-Hadith used to do. The scholars of al-Hadith were different from the scholars of al-Fiqh. And in both groups, there is khair. But the scholars of al-Hadith, because of the Hadith, they are the fuqaha. They are the people of fiqh as well. They have knowledge of the Hadith, the ruling of the Hadith, how do you understand the Hadith, what's applicable and not applicable in the Hadith, what's abrogated in the Hadith, and so forth and so on. So they have fiqh, they have faham of the Hadith, and everything connected to the hadith. Whereas many times the faqih is not a muhaddith. The person who is a faqih or jurist, he doesn't know the hadith. So he wants to show the evil of a talaq. So he uses a weak hadith to support the evil of a talaq. Like the statement that is attributed to al-Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam abghadu al-halal ilallahi al-talaq. So the faqih because of his lack of proficiency and knowledge in hadith, he'll use that hadith. The worst and most hated halal thing to Allah is divorce. The muhaddith doesn't do that. If he uses that hadith, he's going to make istitnas with the hadith. He's just going to use that hadith in addition to the other authentic hadith, just to kind of strengthen it a little bit, but he won't rely on that hadith. He won't rely on it. So this book is like those books. And the top of the list of those scholars, Al-Imam Al-Bukhari. Al-Imam Al-Bukhari's book of hadith, the single most authentic book on the face of the earth after the book of Allah Azza wa Jal. It is a hadith where Al-Imam Al-Bukhari 
from the beginning of the book to the end of the book, he brings his chapter. Whatever the chapter is, the importance of knowledge, the importance of the companions and the virtues, whatever the book is about, divorce, marriage, jihad, whatever the chapter is about, Imam al-Bukhari brings the chapter, and then after bringing the chapter, he doesn't give any kalam. He'll bring the ayat of the Quran that support that point, or he'll bring a hadith, especially the hadith, because it's a book of hadith. So the hadith that he places under that chapter will give you the meaning of what he's trying to do. You don't have to go and read a lot of information in terms of an explanation of an explanation of an explanation. And that's what Ali ibn Abi Talib used to say. He said that the knowledge of al-Islam كان هذا العلم نقتتن ثم دخل فيه من ليس من أهله من ليس من أهله This religion, the knowledge is to be simple and easy. The Prophet would get before the people sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he would speak to them and they comprehended and everybody got up and left. And then the companions did the same thing with the tabi'in. And then the tabi'in did the same thing with the followers of the tabi'in. But then people who were not qualified and competent they started getting involved and they started to put a lot of kalam in the ayat, putting a lot of kalam in the hadith, so it became a lot where the person is overwhelmed with all of the kalam. He's overwhelmed. And the religion of Al-Islam is a simple, basic, easy religion to comprehend. The Prophet described our ummah and he says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Inna ummatana ummatun ummiya la naktub our ummah is an ummah that is illiterate we don't read and we don't write he's not encouraging anyone here not to learn how to read and write not encouraging anyone here from you younger brothers not to excel academically all of you have a religious responsibility a moral challenge that you try to excel academically because as I told you a million times I speak on the behalf of the elders here the fathers who are here if you can turn the clock back, turn my life back again, turn your father's back, life back again, we'll try to do better academically. So let no one understand. None of you young people take that hadith to understand that it means don't read and write, don't learn your religion. Doesn't mean that at all. But the way that the ummah is, many Muslims across the globe, where you find them, they can't read and they can't write. And it's going to be that way until Yom al Qiyamah. Is similar to the issue of al-jihad. The Prophet says, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that horses will always be used for jihad in Islam. Always. That doesn't mean that the Muslims don't learn how to create for themselves weapons on par with the weapons of the enemies of Islam who are excelling in terms of technology. The Muslims are just going to use a knife, a butter knife. They're going to use a table kitchen knife, a fork and a spoon, and they're going to throw themselves in the front of a of a tank no that's not what the hadith is saying the hadith is saying that from the wisdom of Allah جل, as it relates to the jihad of Islam the real jihad of Islam then horses will always be used they will always be used so our ummah we're not in need of complicated information when it comes to learning our religion similar to this issue in the month of Ramadan how do we determine we're going to fast we're not going to fast there are some people who say we have to see the moon. Someone has to see the moon, either locally or internationally. It's only one moon. If someone sees that moon, two people see that moon, we're going to start fasting. Then we have the people who come in and they make it difficult and they say, no, we have to use and we have to rely on calculations. Satellites and this. Islam is not against those calculations. It's not against satellites to help us try to determine the disasters that are going to occur to help us determine what the weather is going to be like tomorrow by Allah's permission. Islam is not against that. But if any of you ever took the time out to try to sit down to comprehend what these people are saying, it's hard to understand what they're talking about. You have to be practically a mathematician to be able to understand what are they talking about. And the Prophet told this ummah, where the ummah just basic and simple. Basic and simple. So with that being the case, Imam al-Bukhari and those scholars of al-Hadith, that was the way that they produced their books. And Shaykh al-Islam Muhammad al-Abdu Wahhab, this is the same thing that he did with his book. He brings the chapter, 
He'll bring the ayat of the Quran to prove the name of the chapter. He'll bring the ahadith to support it. And then he'll bring statements of the companions, statements of the tabi'een, statements of the followers of the tabi'een, statements of the ulama of Islam. And then he goes to the next chapter. And that's it. And that's it. So that's one of the many glaring characteristics that should be mentioned. Keep your religion like that. Basic, simple, something that just can be swallowed just the same way you drink water. One of the criticisms of the book, because there is not a book without any criticism, is that he did bring in the book certain hadith that are not authentic. So whether it is Sheikh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, whether it is Sheikh al-Islam Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab, whether it is the Imam the Sheikh al-Albani or other than him, if a person uses a weak hadith, he thought it was authentic, if he uses a weak hadith to show proof, then we're going to say whoever did it, whoever did it, we're not going to talk bad about him to take anything away from his status, his stature, his position, but we're going to say the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa is enough and we don't need weak hadith at all. And when we use weak hadith and if we use weak hadith, then let them be used and let them be mentioned in the constricted way that the scholars allowed. The scholars of hadith, they allowed that if you use a weak hadith, you let the people know that hadith is weak. And don't say that the prophet said it because he didn't say it, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. If you're going to use a weak hadith, then let that hadith be under yandariju taht aslim in usul al-islam. That hadith is connected to something about the religion. A weak hadith that's telling you to do something like the worst and most hated divorce, uh, halal to Allah is the divorce. That comes in something that is connected to our religion. Divorce is not a nice thing because of what comes as a result of it if it, sh if it was done at the wrong time. Sometimes divorce is the best thing. But if it's done in haste, if it's done as a result of lack of uh, discipline, and sabr, then it's not a good thing. It's a bad thing. It's going to harm people unnecessarily. If everybody started getting divorced in society, we're going to have drama and problems. So the hadith, it comes under something from al-Islam. But the hadith has another problem. The third issue that the scholars said, if you use a weak hadith, it shouldn't be in the ahkam and it shouldn't be in aqidah. Because those two things are serious. The ahkam, halal and haram. Because making halal haram and making haram halal or making something halal or something haram without delil is tantamount to an individual playing Allah, playing the ilah because that's the sole haq of Allah Azza wa Lastly, those scholars, they said that the weak hadith should not have a severe weakness in it because there are different levels of weak hadith just as there are different levels of authentic hadith. So the hadith shouldn't be a severely weak hadith inside of the hadith of people who are liars. Inside of the hadith, the chain of narration are people who are described as being from the Dajjals and so forth and so on. Alakullin, whatever the case is, in this book, there are some weak hadith. There are some weak hadith. The Imam himself, he was a scholar. So we never say the scholar must have known. Sometimes they know, sometimes they don't know. That's not really our job. Sometimes we find out that they do know. Like Imam al-Bukhari brought some weak hadith in his book and he clearly knew they were weak, but he was trying to prove a point. People who study the book properly understand when Bukhari was bringing a hadith that was weak, he knew it was weak. And then you'll understand sometimes, maybe he didn't know. He just thought it was authentic and he put it there. But the point is, all of these things are scholastic topics. We don't need the weak hadith at all. Those of you who have the book there in English, those of you who have the book in English, in many of the English translations of the book, they don't touch upon and make the tanbih and make you aware that these are hadith are weak. So with that being the case, if we do do chapters that have weak hadith in it, will bring it to the table. Now, I don't want anyone to think and to sit and say, oh, this is just a side issue because this is a, an issue that's right in the sulb of the muldur. It's right, connects the essence of what knowledge is all about. The Prophet used to warn the people, like an Imam Muslim brought on the authority of Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu. He described the time that we're living. 
سيكون في آخر الزمان من أمتي ناس يحدثونكم بما لم تسمعوا به أنتم ولا آباؤكم فإياكم وإياهم There's going to come close to the end of time a group of people who will tell you speech and tell you kalam that you never heard of before. You never heard of it and your fathers never heard of it. So you beware of that. And those people who are given that kalam, let them beware of it as well. Storytelling, where you get that kalam from? We're not interested in that. Where did Allah say that? I saw an email today, a text message today. And one of those... Um, Community messages go out encouraging the people to read the Quran. And it said when you read the Quran, when you open it up, shaitani gets a headache. And when you start reading it, you actually read it, shaitani falls out and he loses consciousness. And then when shaitan wakes up and you're still reading the Quran, shaitani does this, that, hey, hey, hey. May Allah bless you for your ikhlas, inshallah, and your desire to give dawah, but who needs that? Where did you get that from? We're living in a time where that's the case. Stories and gimmicks and kalam that is not sanctioned by Allah Azza wa in the kitab, nor in the Prophet Sunnah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So the best speech is the speech of Allah and the best guidance is the guidance of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that comes to us in the authentic hadith. In some books of Kitab al-Tawheed, it just starts off with Kitab al-Tawheed. And then he says, Wa qawlullahi ta'ala. Most of the books had that. But there are some books in Arabic where he starts off with the Basmala. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. And he praises Allah and he sends salutations on the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But those of you who have the book, the ones in English, most of them don't mention that. And even in Arabic, they don't have the Basmala. But we're going to mention now that when it comes to books, learning books, studying books, purchasing books, we have to know and understand some of the history of why certain books, they're the same book by the same scholar, but some of them have some information that others don't have. So the point here is, the point here is, most of the ulama of al-Islam, when they used to write books, they would start off with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim and send in salutations of peace and blessings upon our Nabi al-Amin sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And that's for a number of reasons. There are many books that have been written about the Basmala, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Many books that show the importance of this. It's one of the first ibaras, one of the first sentences that the Muslim child learns. He learns how to say Bismillah, one of the first things. And that's because of the emphasis that the religion placed upon it. The emphasis. The Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, if he wrote letters, like the letter he wrote to the Herakal of Rome, he started off by saying, Bismillah, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim. When he wanted to have contracts and agreements with the Kufab Quraysh, other than them, he would say, Bismillah, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim. This is a contract between Muhammad and the people of Quraysh. The Nabi, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, even gave us certain ibadat, that if you don't say this, Bismillah, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, that ibadat that you're doing is not complete. He said in an authentic hadith, Sallallahu Alaihi wa ala ali wa sallam, La salata illa bi wudu, wa la wudu illa, wa la wudu ali man lam yathkur isma Allahi ta'ala. There's no salat if you don't have wudu. You can't get up and pray without wudu, which is a fascinating point that today, sometimes, in the attempt to give dawah to non Muslims, community cohesion, some imams and du'at, they are participating in this dawah where they come together and give dawah to Jews, Christians, Sikh, Hindus, and stuff like that. And when it's time to pray, they'll say, come and pray with us. There's no salat for the one who doesn't have iman. There's no salat for the one who doesn't have wudu, as this hadith said. And then he said, and this is the point, and there is no wudu for the one who doesn't say bismillah. So part of making the complete Wudu is to say Bismillah. Someone's going to say, but I'm in the toilet, I'm in the bathroom and stuff like that. Should I say Bismillah? You say it under your breath. Now if you say, if you don't say Bismillah and you make Wudu without saying it, your Salat is still, inshallah, okay. And your Wudu is okay because of your niyyah. But the Nabi, the point is, he placed emphasis on that. 
before the person eats, bismillah, before he goes into his house, bismillah, when he comes out of his house, he's making these types of dhikrs of Allah, azawajal. before he puts his clothes on, bismillah, having relationships, all of these issues, they come as a protection. Bismillah comes as a protection. If you take your clothes off and you say bismillah, the jinn don't have the ability to see your aura, to see your nakedness, the nakedness of those people who you have jealousy for. So the point is, starting the book off is from al-Islam. The prophets did it other than our Nabi and our Rasul. In the Quran, the story of Suleiman, when he wrote the letter to the queen of Sheba, I'm not going to call her Bilqis because Allah never called her Bilqis and the prophet never called her Bilqis, just as he never called Adam's son Cain and Abel. So we should try to refrain from that because it wasn't established. It comes from the Israeliyat. In that story, when Suleiman sent the letter to Bilqis, or to the queen of Sheba, when he sent the letter, her leaders took the letter, or they read the letter, and they said, Innuhu min Suleiman, wa innuhu bismillah rahman rahim. This letter is from Suleiman. And this letter is Bismillah ar-Rahman rahim It's in the name of Allah, Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. Nuh, the first Rasul sent to Bani Adam, Salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi, when he got on the boat, when he got on the ark, and the ark was about to leave, he said, Bismillahi majreha. This ark is going to travel in the name of Allah. Is traveling is going to be in the name of Allah Azza So the point here is starting the book off with the Basmala is because it is important in Al Islam. As for sending salutations of peace and blessings upon the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, again, Ikhwani, just as the scholars took care of the Basmala and they gave us a lot of fiqh that we need to understand from the Basmala, it's a lot. Bismillah ar Rahman ar Rahim. Allah ar Rahman ar Rahim. Three of the tremendous names of Allah Azza wa Jal. Three. Allah, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim. They all have a meaning. Those scholars who explain Kitab al they go deep into that explanation. I don't think that's going to benefit this type of audience because the lack of Arabic language. You get an appreciation for that when you know the Arabic language. Why? What is the ba? The harfu jar. Ba. Bismillah. And stop. And the Arab. That's only if you know Arabic. So why are we going to take up one class, two class, and dealing with that? One class or two classes and dealing with that. But it is important. We only pass it by the details of it because it's not wise, in my opinion, to give it to just the regular people in the Daros. It's going to take up a lot of time, and many times it'll be over our heads. I remember in the winter program, one of the sheikhs, he gave one of the classes in fiqh, and he was dealing very deep in some of the details of the language of Surah Al-Fatiha. And as I looked out into the audience, people just seemed lost because the Arabs can appreciate it, but if you don't know the language, the translation is not going to render what the Sheikh is trying to say, especially if it's a translation right on the spot. You have to prepare that so that people can understand those technical terms in the best way. But suffice, suffice it to say, that those three names of Allah Azawajal have been mentioned collectively in certain ayat of the Quran, like in Surah Al Hashar, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala mentioned, "Who Allah, Alladhi la ilaha illahu, Alim al Ghaybi wa Shahada, Who al Rahman al Rahim." So all three of those names. Another issue is those scholars came. They said there's a difference between al Rahman and al Rahim. Both of them come from a Rahma. Both of them come from a Rahma, Allah's mercy. But al Rahman, Allah has a Rahma for all of his creation, believers and non-believers. Ar-Rahim, Allah is only Rahim to the believers. Yom al-Qiyamah. When I show any Rahmah for non-Muslims, Yom al-Qiyamah. No matter who they are, no matter what they did, no matter what their connections were to any of his awliya, like the prophet's parents, like Noah's son, like the imam read today, the two women of the two messengers, Nuh and Lut, they're not going to have any rahmah, yawm al-qiyamah. Allah's ar-rahim to the believers, yawm al-qiyamah, and only the believers. Concerning the book itself, Ikhwani, he began by saying, Kitab at tawhi Kitab at tawhi The reason why Sheikh al-Islam wrote this book is that he traveled to al-Iraq. 
And when he traveled to Al Iraq, a city called Al Basra, it's one of the major cities of Al Islam. And along with Al Baghdad, it used to be a capital of learning. It used to be the epicenter of scholastics in the religion back during the days of Al Imam Ahmed. But after that, it became a place of fitna and a place of shirk and kufr that was being done by the Muslims. When he went to that place, he saw the people worshiping graves. He saw the people worshiping saints who were alive, saints who were dead, saints that they made up. He saw the people swearing by other than Allah. He saw the people engaged in magic. He saw the people doing many things that went against this religion, the Tawheed of Allah Azza wa Jalla swearing by other than Allah they were swearing by their fathers he saw a lot of things so what did he do he made a dawah in Allah he made an amr bin maruf and a nahi an munkar he wrote a book for the people that deals with their condition which brings me to this point and that is people of the sunnah should busy themselves and busy their families and their community and their brothers amongst themselves in an attempt to try to raise off of the ummah ignorance, especially when it comes to a tawheed. Today, many of us have become preoccupied with fighting and warning and planting seeds of discord and hatred amongst ourselves. We want to bring someone to give a talk or a masjid, invite someone, you go and give a talk in that masjid. And they may not be people on the sunnah. So that brother wants to take it as an opportunity to follow the sunnah of the prophets and the messengers. The sunnah of the ulama of al-Islam. To give dawah to the amma to nas, the general public. When he informs people, they come to know that he's about to go to give that talk. What we do is, instead of being practical, instead of having common sense, we start creating drama unnecessarily. And we start to say, you can't go there. Because so and so went there. You can't go there. Because those people do this and those people do that. If you go there, we're going to warn of you. If you go there, then you're... And then we're just busy arguing and debating and creating confusion. And the ummah is steeped in ignorance and shirk and khurafat and superstition and all of that. While the people of the sunnah are arguing and being theoretical, just like Ahlul Kitab. When the truth came to them and the knowledge came to them, they begin to argue and to debate. And they didn't get on with the business of why their prophets and their messengers came to them. So Shaykh al-Islam, rahimahullah ta'ala, let it be known. We hear his name being thrown out there like we hear the names of many of the ulama, the ulama, the ulama. From his sunnah and from his way was getting in the mix and raising off of the people the ignorance that they were upon. And the way that he saw fit and the way that he saw most beneficial that's the reason why he wrote the book he came and he left that place and he continued the book because some of his people were dealing with the same issues the first chapter this is not really even the first chapter it's more like the introduction the first chapter comes after this but in this chapter he's called it kitab al-tawheed and he brought a number of ayat of the quran that's all he brought he didn't even bring any of his kalam the first ayat that he brought is the surah uh, the ayat in Surah al dhariyat this ayat, I encourage you brothers to memorize the ayat. This one ayat, those of you who did not, not memorize, is going to come up again and again and again, especially for an individual who knows the importance of a tawheed. He's going to be given dawah to a tawheed and mentioning to a people the importance of a tawheed. This is one of the clearest and most important ayats concerning that. And it is the statement of Allah Ta'ala that makes it clear why we're here? وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونِ I have not created mankind. I didn't create the jinn. I didn't create mankind except for the sole purpose of worshiping me. The reason why we're sitting here right now. All of us. Allah created us and put us here for his ibadah. So the person has to come to know what is that ibadah and how should he be worshipped. And at the top of the list is that Allah should be worshipped with a tawheed because he alone is the one who created Benny Adam and he's the one who created the jinn. Both of those categories of his creation are responsible. Yomul Qiyamah, what did they bring to the table? What are they going to bring Yomul Qiyamah in the way of 
at tawheed or in the way of what is the opposite of at tawheed. The next ayat that he brought, Khwani, is the ayat in Surah Al Nahl, ayat number 36, Surah Al Nahl. Allah Ta'ala mentioned, وَلَقَدْ بَعَثْنَا فِي كُلِّ أُمَّةٍ رَسُولًا أَنِعْبُدُ اللَّهَ وَاجْتَنِبُ الطَّاغُوتِ We sent to every nation a Rasul. Every group of people had a messenger. Every group without any exception. Europeans, white people had messengers. Everybody, Chinese people, everybody had messengers. The people who are living now, their messenger is Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who said I was given five things no other prophet was given before me. And the one thing that he was given that no other prophet was given before him is he was the prophet in the past was sent to his people specifically and he was sent to all of the people. So whoever existed in the way of Bani Adam prior to the Nabi coming sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Allah sent to all of those people a Rasul. And when that messenger came to his people he called them to the Tawheed of Allah. He called them to worship Allah alone and to disbelieve in the Taghut. And that is the formula of Al Nafi wal Ithbat. La ilaha illallah, there is no God worthy of worship except Allah. You negate that anyone, anything has the right to be worshipped, and then you establish except Allah. Al Nafi wal Ithbat. So those prophets came with that dawah. An Ibudullah wa Chtanibu Taghut. Worship Allah, establish it, and don't worship the taghut. The meaning of the taghut in this context comes from the word a turyan, a turyan, and it means a tajawaz, to go overboard. To go overboard. To go overboard. A turyan, you're dealing with something, you're dealing with someone, and you go overboard in your oppression, you go overboard. The taghut is any and everything that's worshipped along with Allah, other than Allah. And that thing is pleased with being worshipped. So let not anybody make the mistake and come and say, Isa ibn Maryam was a taghut. The sun is a taghut. The moon is a taghut. The monkey, the cow is a taghut. They are not pleased with being worshipped. And they're going to free themselves from those people who worship them. Yomu Qiyama. Everything that is not pleased with being worshipped along with Allah. And they know that the people are worshipping them or they don't know. Yomul Qiyama, they're going to be rejected. Unlike the movies that come out where they always have the ulama of the Jews asking him because it's in the Bible, are you the son of God? Are you the son of God? Every movie about Isa ibn Maryam, they have that in them. All of those famous movies. Movie out like right now, they have that. You see the trailer and they're asking him that. That movie that came out recently, the big one, same thing. You're the son of God? And he says, yes, I'm the son of God. It's Kedip. Kedip. He didn't know that the people worshipped him while he was living. So therefore, Allah Ta'ala will mention to him, Yawm al-Qiyama, Ya Isa ibn Maryam, A'anta qutta lil-nas ittakhiduni wa ummiya ilahaini min duni Allah? Qala subhanaka. Isa, did you tell the people take you and your mother as two guys along with Allah? He said, glory unto Allah. I never said to those people except what you told me to say. And if I did tell them that, you would have known because you know what's inside of me and I don't know what's inside of you. I don't know what you, Allah, what, what, what your knowledge and so forth and so on. So those prophets, those messengers, those oliya, the creations of Allah that will worship, they'll come and they'll free themselves from those who worship them. So the fact is this second ayat is an ayat of a tawheed. And it shows what's the da'wah of the prophets and the messengers? The da'wah of the prophets and the messenger is calling the people to the worship of Allah. First and foremost, that's the second ayat that the imam brought. The third ayat in in Surah Al-Isra is the statement of Allah Ta'ala, وَقَضَى رَبُّكَ أَلَّا تَعْبُدُ إِلَّا إِيَّاهُ وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا Your Lord has legislated, he made it wajib that you worship only him. You don't worship anyone other than him and that you're good to your parents. Allah Ta'ala has made it wajib. He legislated that you worship him alone, alone, and you are good to your parents with ihsan. And many ayat of the Quran, this one and the next one, and many ayats of the hadith of the Nabi, many statements, it puts the haqq of Allah along with the haqq of the parent. 
whoever doesn't give his parents their haq, he is not giving Allah Ta'ala his haq. Because it was through the vessel of the mother and the father that the individual is here. And the hadith said, Man lam yashkurin nas, lam yashkurillah. Whoever doesn't thank the people who hasn't thanked Allah. So the individual has to take it upon himself to be respectful. Similar to that, and an added thing for the woman is her husband. The Prophet told the woman sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that the woman will not give Allah his rights until she gives her husband his rights. Doesn't mean that the parents are over Allah equal to Allah. Doesn't mean that the husband is over Allah equal to Allah. But because of their position, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he legislated that he made their haq along with his haq. They said to him, Ya Rasulullah, what is the best deed that someone can do? He said, worship Allah and don't do any shirk. Another hadith said to make salat. The man said, and then after that, what's the best deed? He said, birru walidin. Allah first and then the parents. So this ayat goes to show again that Allah Ta'ala qada that the people only worship him and they don't worship other than him subhanahu wa ta'ala. He brought the next ayat from Surah An-Nisa. وَعْبُدُ اللَّهَ وَلَا تُشْرِكُوا بِهِ شَيْئًا Worship Allah alone and don't make any shirk with Allah. And nafi wal ithbat Establishing and negating. Many times this type of formula is being used in the Quran. Khwani, pay attention here. And you should write this down if you have a book. This ayat of Surah An-Nisa mentions the same thing that's mentioned in the next ayat. But the next ayat, I think we need to mention a little bit about this ayat in Surah Al-An'am. Surah Al-An'am. Ayat number 151 to 153. But he only brought the beginning of the ayat where he commanded the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam قُلْ تَعَالُوا أَتْلُوا مَا حَرَّمَ رَبُّكُمْ عَلَيْكُمْ أَلَّا تُشْرِكُوا بِهِ شَيْئًا The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was commanded tell them ya Muhammad tell them come halumu ta'alu come let me read to you let me tell you what my Lord made haram for you. And the first thing he mentioned that you don't make shit with Allah Azza wa Jalla. And then he went on to mention nine other issues. So it's ten altogether. The scholars call this ayat the ayat al huquq al ashr, the ayat of the ten rights. Some people said it may have some connection to what the Jews and the Christians have in their book and what's called the Ten Commandments. But some of the things that are mentioned in this ayat are not mentioned in those Ten Commandments, but many of the things that are mentioned in this ayat are mentioned in the Ten Commandments. So those Ten Commandments, they may have some validity, some asl in Al-Islam. Because although they're in the Bible, each one of them is something that is supported by Al-Islam. So what's the name of this ayat? Because the scholars used to make ikhtisar and they used to shorten things, the delil for that is the hadith of Jibril. The proof for that is the hadith as-sadiq wal mustuq the proof of that is the hadith of the Asif. The proof for that is the ayat of Al-Hukuq Al-Ashr. The ten Hukuq. The ten. What did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mention without reading all of the Quran or the ayat? The first one is that the people, they do not make a shirk. And then after that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned that you are kind to your parents. And then after that, he made it prohibited for a person to kill his children out of fear of being impoverished. Don't kill your children out of fear that you're going to be impoverished. The fourth one is that Allah Ta'ala prevented the people from coming to al-fawahish. The fawahish that is clear or the fawahish that is hidden. Number five, he told them, don't kill any human being except the individual who deserve to be killed. In the religion. He did something. As a result of that, the legislation of Islam said that the retribution for that crime or that sin is that he loses his life in the right way, of course. So the next point is number five, murder, not to murder anyone. And then the next one is not to come close to the money of the orphan. It didn't say don't steal the money of the orphan. It said, La taqrubu mal al yatim. Don't come close to it. So if you can't come close to it, you're not going to steal it. Don't think about it. Don't take responsibility for the money of the orphan if you can't take care of it because it's from the major sins that will destroy you. And then the number 
seven or number six was that people should be fair and just. They should weigh in fairness and justice, and they should be fair and just in the way that they deal with people. Number seven is the contracts that Allah made with us. The contracts that Allah made with us, that you don't make shit with Allah. That you get up for Salatul Fajr and the rest of the prayers. That the lady, she wears hijab. All of those contracts that the ayahs and the hadith described as being contracts. The Prophet said there are five prayers to be done in a day and a night. A contract that Allah took with the sons of Adam. Whoever takes care of them, he will come Yom Al-Qiyamah and he will have agreement from Allah that Allah will not punish him. Whoever doesn't take care of those five prayers which is a contract he didn't take care of them he won't have a contract with Allah Yom Al-Qiyamah if Allah please if he wills he'll forgive him if he wills he'll punish him so that is number nine and the last one that was mentioned was follow the way of the Prophet following the Sunnah is the tenth one so that ayat is called ayat Al-Huquq al asha the ten rights. The Imam after that, as I mentioned, he brought ayat. Now he's going to bring one of the statements of the companions about that ayat. And the first companion that's mentioned in this book is none other than Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud said about that ayat, if anyone wants to see the wasiyah or the nasiha, what the prophet left for his community. You want to be aware of what the prophet told. Hold on to this. He said, then let him look at this ayat. And then he read the ayat of the ten hukuk all the way to the end of the ayat. And that is an authentic ether of Abdullah bin Mas'ud. He went on to mention some issues concerning that ikhwani and he finished that chapter with the last hadith of Mu'adh ibn Jabal, the second companion who was mentioned in this book, Mu'adh ibn Jabal. He said, I was with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam and I was riding on the back of his donkey, Akramakumullah. So the Prophet asked me, Ya Mu'adh, tadri ma haqqullahi ala al-ibad. Do you know the rights that Allah has over his servants? Mu'adh ibn Jabal, he said, Allah and his messenger, they know best. Do you know the haq that Allah has over his servants? And do you know the haq that the servants have over Allah? He said, Allah and his messenger know best. The Prophet told him, Sallallahu Alaihi wa ala alihi wa sallam, Haqullahi ala al-ibad, an ya'buduhu wa la yushriku bihi shay'a, wa haqul ibadi ala allahi, an la yu'adhiba man la yushriku bihi shay'a. Qutu ya Rasulullah, afala ubashiru nas, qala sallallahu alaihi wa sallam, la tubashirhum. The Prophet says, وسلم, the rights that Allah has over the slaves, that they don't make shit with him. They worship him alone. And the rights that the slaves have over Allah is that if they don't make shit with him, then Allah won't punish them. Mu'adh said, Ya Rasulullah, should I go and tell the people about this good news? Should I not just tell them don't make shit with Allah? He said, no. Because if you go and you tell them that, some of them are just going to rely on that. They won't make salat. They won't do zakat. They won't do this. They won't do that. They'll just say, okay, I'm going to say la ilaha illallah and I'm going to sit back and I'm going to relax. And that's a proof and an indication of a lot of things. This hadith very quickly, a a hadith that shows the etiquette that the Prophet had, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, with his companions. How the sheikh should have rahmah with a student. It shows the humility of Rasulullah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. How he allowed that young boy, Mu'adh ibn Jabal, to stay behind him so close on the riding beast. It showed the humility of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in that he rode a donkey in the first place. A donkey. The Kufav Quraysh, Abu Lahab, Abu Jahl, they wouldn't get caught dead on a donkey. Because in their mind, in their society, to ride a donkey, it means you're poor, you're miskeen, and the donkey is not an animal that is considered to be like the horse the stallion, the war horse, the Arabian stallions. Now that's, that's the kind of horse they want to drive. That's what they want to ride. The Nabi, he knew that al izza power, might. it's not in the type of car you have. Not in the type of car you have. It's not the street that you live on. It's not the university that you go to. 
The izza in al-Islam is a person having a connection with Allah Azza wa Jal. Being plugged in and being in tune with what Allah may wage upon. So some of the rich people, like the president of the U.S., that man is a powerful man. He has a lot of power. But compared to the regular Muslim, the regular Muslim, who if the two of them die, him on Kufr and this man on Islam, that poor Muslim will be dipped into the Jannah. And that dipping into the Jannah is going to be like unlike any other thing. Whereas that non-Muslim who had all of that money, all of that money, when he's dipped into the knot of Jahannam, he's going to be asked, did you ever see any good in your life? He's going to say, well, I never saw no good in my life. I never tasted, I never experienced, I never saw no good because now he's confronted with being in the knot of Jahannam, being punished forever. So the point is, the Nabi taught us practically, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, don't think Izza strength is based upon these frivolous issues like this. A person is strong if he has a, a strong looking dog walking with him. He has a mean dog walking with him. This is not our religion. The hadith also goes to show Khwani that the truth doesn't always have to be said. The truth doesn't always have to be said. We know that there is a hadith. Men su'ila an ilmin fakatamohu uljima bi min nar yomul qiyama. If someone is asked about something and he knows the truth, but he doesn't say it, he will be made to wear a bridle of fire, yomul qiyamah, as punishment. That's a hadith. You know the truth, and someone asks you, hey, what about this one? What do you think about what they're doing? And you're afraid to say because you don't want to fall out of favor. You're afraid to say because of whatever. The Nabi says, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the recompense for that, the jaza, the thawab for that is, He's going to be burnt by that bridle of fire. But there are some situations that may present themselves to the person. If he were to say the truth, he's going to get his head chopped off. If he were to say the truth, he's going to get put in prison. And the hadith said if a person is asked about the truth, he's asked about the truth. No one asks Mu'adh ibn Jabal anything. He said, Ya Rasulullah, should I not go? He said, don't tell him. Because if the people hear that information, they're going to be like the people who say, all I have to do is say, La ilaha illallah, Iman is in my heart, I don't have to do anything. Whoever says, La ilaha illallah is going to go to Jannah, and that's it. Abu Hurara in Sahih Bukhari, who talked about the condition of the people during his time, when Yazid ibn Muawiyah, radiallahu anhu, was the Khalifa. Abu Hurara said, when the fitna was spreading, he said, if I were to tell you people, my students, all of the hadith that I heard from the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam about these people who were ruling and controlling, if I were to tell you all those hadith, then verily they're going to come and chop my head off. Because some of those hadith tell about how this is that time of the bad leaders and so forth and so on. So he didn't say it. No one's going to go and say Abu Huraira hid the knowledge he had not. There's a time and a place for everything. So I say that just to mention. If we go to the Janazah tomorrow, we go to the graveyard of the Janazah, you go to the Janazah of your relatives, and that Janazah is being held in some of these masajid of Birmingham that are known for not implementing pure Islam and the Sunnah, some of the big ones, the famous ones, like the one that's over here at that roundabout, like the one that's over there in Alam Rock, not too far from St. Saviour's Road. On St. Saviour's Road, some of these masajid where our relatives make shirk, don't start arguing with the people at the Janaza. That's the worst place to start arguing. If you can give down when people want to listen to you, don't do this, don't do that. And they're going to listen, then do it. But if you start giving them dawah and they start calling you Wahhabi and you start arguing with them and it's at the Janaza, that is nastiness to the dawah and it's nastiness to the dead and it's nastiness to the people we're living we have to have more hikmah than that the prophet did that with his companions sallallahu alaihi wasallam there's a time and a place for everything that's the point a time so the person has to know when to talk and he has to know when he shouldn't talk when he shouldn't talk and that comes straight to us from the sunnah of the nabi sallallahu alaihi wa ala alihi wasallam that's the introduction of Al-Imam Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab. After that, he brought the chapter, Bab Fadr al-Tawheed wa ma yukafuru min al-Dhanub. The chapter of the virtues of al-Tawheed 
and what a tawheed expiates and wipes away from the mistakes that people make and the sins that people make. We'll do about two or three chapters at each class and two or three qaidas or qawaid from each class, inshallah, azawajal. But for today, we're going to bring that to a close right now and we're going to open up the door if you guys have any questions. Akhi, Zakaria, tafadl. So the brother Zakaria wants to know the hadith of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam five prayers have been made wajib upon the person the day and the night anyone who does them and he comes with them yomul qiyamah he will have a contract with Allah azawajal that he won't punish them he didn't make a stighfaf and didn't look at them as being light he will have a contract Allah won't punish him and on the other hand, the person who doesn't come with them, Yomul Qiyami, missed him here and there, then he won't have a contract with Allah. If Allah wishes, Allah will punish him. If Allah wishes, Allah will forgive him. Can that hadith be used as a delil for the people who say, if you don't pray as a result of being lazy, not as a result of not believing in the prayer, but the person is lazy, like many people from the ummah, lazy, so you miss prayer here or there. Is that a proof that the person is not a kafir? That is a proof. And it's what is used by the scholars of Al-Islam to push that away. Shaykh al-Bani has a nice book where he tried to be balanced and he tried to deal with both sides. And he called his book Kitab Tariq al-Salat. The great scholar Al-Imam ibn al-Qayyim, he brought that book in his book as well, Tariq al-Salat. And before them, the big, big, big Hanbali scholar Al-Imam Muhammad ibn al-Nasr al-Marwazi. He has a book called Kitab Ta'zim Qadr al-Salat. And he brought that hadith. And the scholars who take the position that you are not a kafir if you don't pray as a result of laziness, this is one of the strongest proofs that they have. It's one of the strongest proofs. Because the hadith was clear. And it said anyone who doesn't do them, he won't have a contract with Allah Yom al -Qiyamah. It doesn't mean though that the one who abandons Salat is not falling into a major crime. It's from the Akbar al kabair and Imam Ibn Hazm said that after a shirk, the biggest sin is not murder, not zina, not drinking khamr. The biggest sin after ben, after shirk is leaving off the prayer, leaving off a Salat. It is an action of kufr. And a person can't go outside of the fold of Islam. Fadl ya akhi. Say it again. Uh, the brother wants to know about the statement that the ulama made that there was no ikhtilaf between the scholars, the companions in Aqidah. That the scholars said that there's no ikhtilaf between the companions when it came to Aqidah. They had ikhtilaf when it came to fiqh. But when it came to the affairs and the issues of Aqidah, there's no ikhtilaf. But isn't that statement 
proved wrong because when it came to the issue of did the Prophet see Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam on the night of Al-Isra wa Mi'raj and he went up to see Allah some of the companions like Aisha may Allah be pleased with her she said he never saw Allah and anyone who says that he saw Allah is a lion it makes my hair stand on end and Abdullah ibn Abbas said he did see Allah because he told me Ra'aytu Rabbi al-Bariha when he came back he said I saw my Lord last night they said what did he look like Ya Rasulullah asked him what did he look like he said Nurun anna arahu it was light I'm going to tell you what he looked like it was light so isn't this ikhtilaf Aisha said no Ibn Abbas said yes so the answer to that is it's better for us not to say that the companions had ikhtilaf in aqidah it's better not to say I used to say that the companions had ikhtilaf in aqidah that issue the issue of the khawarij were they Muslims or were they kuffar some of the companions said yes some said no the issue of the dead person hadith said he's going to some companions said he's going to be punished by the wailing of the people who are living and some said no he's not going to be punished so they had what appeared to be some ikhtilaf concerning some of the furor some of the branches of aqidah but it's better safer say that they never had ikhtilaf because none of the companions understood that the prophet didn't see Allah at all none of them said Allah can't be seen like the people of innovation came and they said so the scholars put that in their books they didn't say that what Aisha was saying is that the prophet sallallahu didn't see Allah with a naked eye and no one can see Allah with a naked eye so when the Dajjal comes and claims that he is Allah he's a liar because Allah can't be seen in this dunya when Musa asked Allah Azzawajal, show me yourself and Allah Ta'ala manifested a speck of himself a small speck of himself he said to Musa look at the rock if it can the mountain if it stays in its place you'll be able to see me and the rock went asunder it fell down and Musa lost consciousness so those issues the scholars from the companions those companions in the issues of al aqidah it was ikhtilaf in the statement, ikhtilaf in part of it, but they never rejected the whole thing. The dead person, when Aisha said that the dead person will not be punished, what she meant was, if the dead person is not responsible for the wailing, then he won't be punished. As for the hadith, the hadith means if the dead person told his family, cry and scream when I die then he's going to be punished. If the dead person didn't educate them about the religion, what to do and what not to do at the janazah, then he's going to be punished. But if he didn't have anything to do with it, then Aisha's position was correct. The khawarij, the same issue. Ali radiallahu anhu said, they're not kuffar. They were trying to get away from al-kufr. Some of the other companions said, no. The prophet said they would go in and out of this religion just like the arrow goes in and out of the game. So it's better not to say that the companions had Ikhtilaf. That was what Sheikh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, after one of the brothers who is in London at a masjid where I used to talk at, Tottenham, his name is Abdul Rahman, he was one of the teachers there. He sent me a nice bath about that. I looked in it and he was nice about it. Abu Sama, have a look at this, what Sheikh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah said and what other scholars said. And you read it, as Sheikh al-Fawzan, you say, yeah, it's better to take this position than to take this other position. He wasn't like the people who want to now destroy you and say you're an innovator because you made that point. You're an innovator because you made that point. What person doesn't make mistakes from the companions all the way down to the people who are sitting here right now? So making a mistake, Ikhwani, to err is human. And Allah knows best. Okay, Ikhwani, this is the last question from a man right here. We know about the hadith because Mu'adh evidently started telling the people after the fear of what the Prophet ﷺ was afraid of dissipated and disappeared. So this hadith could be one of those hadith for an example in the beginning when the people started first coming into Islam. So many things he used to not allow at the beginning of Islam. 
He told the companion sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa radiyallahu anhum ajma'in Kuntu qad nahaytukum an ziyarat al-qubur fazuruha fa innaha tudhakkirukum bil-akhira I used to not let you people go to the grave in Mecca. I didn't allow you when someone died. I didn't allow you to go to the graveyard. You bury them and you get out. He said, but now I'm telling you, go and visit the graveyard because it reminds you of the hereafter. The scholars said the reason why the Prophet ﷺ didn't allow them to visit the graveyard at the beginning of Islam is, you know, the Arabs, the nature of some of the Bedouins, some of the Arabs, they're new to Islam, so they're going to say things. They're going to make mistakes. They're going to do crazy things from what they had in Jahiliya. They go on the war, and the expedition, and they say, Ya Rasulullah, make us a tree the way these kuffar have a tree. The kuffar put their weapons on the tree to get power so that when they fight the Muslims, the sword, the spear, it's going to be stronger. So when some of the new Muslims saw that, they said, whoa, whoa, whoa. Ya Rasulullah, they got a tree. Make us a tree too. We want a tree too. The Prophet said, hey, you people have done the same thing that the people did with my brother Musa. May Allah have mercy upon my Musa. I'm my brother Musa. Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali, they never said that because they were established in Islam. So when the Nabi died, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it wasn't the people of Mecca, it wasn't the people of Medina in the metropolitan areas of Islam. They weren't the ones who postated. It was the people who were in the desert. The people who were not close to those companions. The new Muslims, the Arabs, the Bedouins. They're the ones when the Nabi died. They were connected to his personality. He's dead, khalas, finish. We're not going to give zakat anymore. And they apostated. But those who were on Islam, thabitun on al-Islam, they didn't do that. So the fear that he had, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, obviously must have dissipated. So Mu'ad ibn Jabal is going to now narrate the hadith like right now we're not afraid that anyone is going to take that hadith now he doesn't do any work because the religion is complete now and there are too many ayat and too many hadith that come to show him you can't sit down and do that but at that time it's the beginning of Islam it's the beginning of Islam and Allah my Lord and your Lord he is a'la and a'lam hadha wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyina وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته